Zechariah, my wife loves the Old Testament, so do I. Zechariah is a couple of books before the New Testament, so it's toward the end of your Old Testament. So many people are under the misnomer that if you're in Jesus, the devil has no way to get to you, or he has no way to bother you, or he has no way to be in your presence. And that's not true. The enemy is constantly bombarding Christians to give up. In fact, the last poll that I had read several uh, several months ago, really, is that 4,000 churches and pastors are giving up every single month. 4,000 churches are closing. More churches are closing. More people are, are satisfied to stay home. Um, the big thing that's now happening is what's called the media church, where people are staying home and watching uh, a service on television. But I believe that what is happening is that the enemy wants us to surrender. God wants us to be a church without spot or wrinkle. He wants us to be a light that's not hidden, but on a hill, so that we can show forth who Christ is. Even in the midst of our enemies, even when our enemies are, are, are backbiting us and talking about us and doing all kinds of things against us, we still love our enemies. We still uh, help our enemies. And by doing that, that should be the character of Christ that they see in us. Uh, but there comes a time, you know, when you have to fight. You know, there's a time of war and there's a time to be at peace. That's Ecclesiastes that says that. So in chapter 3 of Zechariah this morning, I want to share something with you. And uh, he's going to share it from the NLT Bible, but I'm going to be reading from the King James Bible. Chapter 3, starting with verse 1. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. I want to read it from the NLT now, if I may. Then the angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Satan, was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Joshua. The angel here is representative of God. And Satan, his name means the adversary. The adversary. Now the definition of the word adversary is this. One that contends with or opposes or resists. Let me say that again. The definition of adversary is one that contends with. You know what contending with means? It means one that's constantly oppressing, one that's constantly in battle, one that's constantly opposing, one that's constantly accusing, one that is constantly against you and me. This is the word adversary. Anytime you see the word enemy, it means adversary. And he says, one who resists an enemy or an opponent of, or a clever adversary. And he is the one that comes and accuses us. He is the one that comes against us when God is trying to get us to a place that he has for us you can be sure that the adversary, Satan himself, is going to be right there, maybe not him personally, because he can't be everywhere present, but he'll have his demon spirits there to oppose you, to stop you, and to prevent you from becoming the man or the woman of God that God has created you to be. Now people say, well, you, they, can't, they, can't, uh, you know, they can't stop God. No, they can't stop God, but they can stop you. 
And so, in Exodus chapter 23, verse 22, I'll read that for you. You don't have to look it up, but you can write it down for a future reference if you want to. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, meaning the Lord, and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thy enemies and an adversary unto thy adversaries. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's read it again. If you are careful to obey him, following all my instructions, then I will be an enemy to your enemies, and I will oppose those that oppose you. Isn't that wonderful? You know, it amazes me, and I just want to talk a little moment here on a politic aspect. It amazes me that the very things that they're trying to do to Trump and trying to bring him down is exactly what's happening to them. What they're trying to expose and trying to dig in and trying to dig out on, on Trump is actually being dug out on them. Well, the Bible says that in Romans. Thou art inexcusable, O man, that judgest another, for when thou judgest another, you are doing the very same thing. But God says if we'll obey his voice, if we'll listen to him, then he says he will be an adversary to our adversaries. I think it was Leisha said something this morning. She said uh, that we don't have to wrestle. But I disagree because the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. For we, 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 we. Now, some people would like to put a period there, for we wrestle not, period. But that's not true. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers of wickedness in high places. There is a fight going on for your soul, even as you are sitting here in this assembly and watching by Facebook this morning. There is an adversary that is sitting next to you or close to you and whispering in your ear, don't listen to this man, what he is saying. He'll distract you in thinking about a thousand and one things that will be going on today. He'll get your mind wandering to a different place than where you are right now. He'll get you thinking about what is the next thing you're going to do as soon as you leave here. And as you're thinking about those things, the very thing that God wants to deposit into your spirit will be missed. And you'll catch yourself wandering, your mind wandering, going somewhere else, and you say, what did I miss? I just missed something that God had for me. Joshua 5.13 says this, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. Now you know that Jericho had fortified walls. We heard about that this morning. Jericho had fortified walls. Linda and I, we, as we stood on Mount Carmel, we looked over and we saw Jericho. I believe it was, wasn't it on Mount Carmel or was it at the, uh, that peak, that mountain peak that we were at? I think one of the two, I think it was at the mountain peak. And we saw Jericho, modern Jericho. And we looked over and we saw the very place that God told the Israelites they would obtain victory. And it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. I want to tell you this morning that though you may not see in the spiritual realm, there are entities in the spiritual realm. There are angels in the spiritual realm. There are demons in the spiritual realm. But there are God's servants in the spiritual realm. 
When we talk about the spiritual realm, a lot of times we think it's only about demons. But no, we also have adversaries that are on our side. God said, he said, if you will obey my voice, I will, I will be an adversary to your adversaries. And so Joshua here, he's by the road Jericho, a very difficult place, a place of battle. And he lifted up his eyes and he looked and he beheld, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said unto him, Are thou for us or for our adversaries? Are you for us or are you against us? And if you read the context of the story, he was for them, and he was going to go there, and he was going to fight the battle. But there was still something that Joshua and the Israelites needed to do. They needed to hold their peace, but every time they went around, on the, on the time that they made a full circle, they were to shout. They didn't have to fight with swords and spears, but they shouted. And on the seventh time around, when they went around, they shouted, and the walls of Jericho came down. Can I tell you something this morning? If you have walls that are built up in your life over, the, over time that the enemy has come in and, and done covalt operations in you and and in your mind, listen to me, please. Don't be distracted. And the enemy has come and he's caused a fortified uh, a sit, uh, fort in your mind. You need to be free. Then you need to shout. You need to shout praises unto God. Hallelujah. Many times when the enemy is coming to attack you, instead of getting so uh, self-pitied and getting so self-centered and getting so self-thinking, and oh, what am I going to do next? And where am I going to go next? And what's going to be my next turn? Begin to praise and worship God. Begin to lift up your hands and worship God. And God will take care of your adversaries as you obey Him and as you walk in His ways. I want you to understand this morning that God is for you. God is for you. He's not against you. He's for you making it. He's for you having victory. He's for you fighting the good fight of faith. He's for you. He's for you. Hallelujah. He's for you. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 15 says this. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it, it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to nothing that we returned all of us to the wall and every one of us to his work. When you understand that God can bring the counsel of the enemy and the counsel of those who will oppose you to nothing. All we have to do is not surrender. Hallelujah. Greatness through toughness. We had Kim Jong Yong, whatever his name, Rocket Man, whatever his name is, threaten the United States with a nuclear button on his desk. Can I tell you, we don't have a wimp in the White House today. He said that would be the gravest mistake he ever made, and North Korea will not exist any longer if he makes that decision. Oh, you know, we shouldn't do that. We have to be nice. We have to be diplomatic. We have to, 
you know, we have to talk about things. That doesn't get you anywhere when someone has a button on their desk. Oh, we have, to, we have to just, you know, appease them. No. No, that's a form of surrender. Don't surrender. That's why I love Israel. I don't know about you, but I love Israel. I love the leadership of Israel. And some of you may know this, some of you may not know this, but Israel has a, a defense system called Goliath. I'm sorry, Samson. It's called the Samson Project. Anyone ever hear that? Who's heard of the Samson Project? Raise your hand, you heard Samson Project. Nobody's heard that? The Samson Project that Israel has is this. Every nation that's surrounding Israel that is of, of Muslim descent that has threatened Israel's extinction, there is a nuclear warhead all throughout the land of Israel that are planted. And all Israel has to do is hit one button and all those nuclear weapons will be launched at their enemies and it will burn them off the face of the earth. Don't believe for one moment the lies that you're hearing on television that Israel does not want peace. They have given up so much of their land that God gave them to have peace. They have done so much to have peace. They have surrendered much to have peace, and the opposition has given zero. He will bring their counsel to nothing. Are you having any kind of problems? Are you having any problems with the government? With your neighbor? With a friend? Put them in the hands of God. Give them over to God. Don't mumble and complain and grumble because that will only keep you in the desert. Wandering around wondering why God is not answering your prayer when all you have to do is begin to thank Him, begin to praise Him, because God will use everything and anything He needs to use to get you to die to self. I didn't get one amen. Wow. He will bring their counsel to nothing. I like what David said in Psalm 3, verses 1 to 8. It was a time when Absalom was after him. Think about this. Your very own son that grew up in your home, grew up in your house, your very own son one day decides that he's going to take over. Think of that. One day your son comes and he begins to win the favor of the people over to him. Secretly without you knowing. He has this secret meetings. Has his secret dinners. And he entertains them and he wins their hearts. And now... He wants to take over David's throne, his position. And here David writes this psalm, and he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, Lord, how are they that increased that trouble me? So many are against me. You ever feel that way? Everyone's against you. That your best friend talks about you. Your co-worker laughs at you. Many are the enemies that trouble me. He said, many are they that rise up against me. 
And then there many there be which say of my soul, there is no hell. Verse 2, for him and God. Think about that. The enemy of your soul that comes to rob, steal, kill, and destroy everything that God has and wants to establish on earth. He did it with Adam and Eve. He put Adam and Eve here on the earth to cultivate the earth and replenish the earth. And that word replenish in the Hebrew doesn't mean to bring back that which was once there. No, that doesn't mean that. It means to fill. That's where people get off thinking that's antediluvian period and all that garbage. It doesn't mean replenish, like we would replenish a stock of whatever we had. We would replenish our groceries. No, replace what was there at one time. No, it meant to fill the earth. And because the enemy came in opposition as an adversary to destroy the very things that God had intended for this earth. See, people always blame God for the problems of the earth. They blame God for the troubles of mankind. But they never turn the tables around to themselves. See, God's intention through Adam was to establish righteousness, socially, industrially, agriculturally, to influence all of those areas of life so that men would not be greedy and selfish, and only think about themselves until the enemy came and caused Eve and Adam to be selfish. Wanting something more than what God had intended. And that's where the trouble lies. When we want more than what God has intended for us, we get into trouble. And he said, there, he said, and they say, which of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like God's not going to help you this time? And I, I want you to know that there are times like that. We all go through those times. But there are times when you know the faithfulness of God, when you've seen God do things in your life and that faith that you've seen him do those things and he's come through for you. It's those times of faith that will give you a, a, a better or a greater measure of faith for the things you will face in the future. And hasn't he always supplied? Hasn't he always right on time? It's amazing. He always seems to do it right on time. But he said there's no help for him in God. And there's a word in the Psalms called Selah. You've probably seen that when you read the Psalms. That means pause and think about that. That's what Selah means. Pause and think about that. Hmm. They're saying there's no help for me in God? And then he goes on and he says this. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. Hallelujah. You know what shields do? They protect. Remember the old Roman movies you see? The Romans, they all stand in a the line. They shoot the arrows up in the air. And then the, the, as the arrows are coming down, they all lift up their shields and the arrows hit the shields. For thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. So when you're down and when you're depressed and when you're going through things, you know, you see, you see the, the depressed, they always hang down like this. He said, lift up your head, O ye gates, for the king of glory shall come in. Lift up your heads. I will look to the hills, not to the valleys. I'll look to the hills from whence cometh forth my help. My help comes in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. You've got to have that kind of attitude in order to be a warrior. As my wife was saying about the spies, you know, there was, uh, the spies went out and there was only two of them that came back and said, we can take this land. We can take this land. 
And the others said, can't do it. Why was that? Why did they come back with that report? Because they didn't go by faith. They went by what they saw. They saw the giants. They saw the fortified cities. They saw these things, and it overwhelmed them, and they went from feelings rather than from faith. They went from what they thought and their limitations to God can't do this. It's impossible. But there was two. There was two. Joshua and Caleb. The Bible says that they had a different, say it with me, different. They had a different spirit. They didn't have a spirit of the world. They didn't have a spirit of man. They didn't have a spirit of defeatism. They didn't have a, a, a spirit of surrender. They said, we can do this. Not because we're stronger. Not because we have better weaponry. Not because we know better and we know the land. No, not because of those things, but because of who we know. And because he said it. He said that he has given, this, he has given us this land. Because he has promised to be with us and that he will fight against our adversaries if we obey his voice. He said, go in and possess the land. Go in and possess the land. When God speaks that, go in and possess the land. You need to get up and go in and possess the land. And I'm not talking about the land of the earth. I'm talking about the land that the enemy has taken over territory in you. The areas that you are still in bondage. The areas that you are still fighting for. The same uh, areas that you've been struggling over and over and over and over and over again for years and years and years and years. God says it's time for you to stop surrendering and it's time for you to stop getting victory. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down, slept. I awakened, for the Lord sustained me. Look at this. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. Wow. Ten thousands of people. That's thousands upon thousands. If they were against you. We don't have a natural uh, enemy in the flesh. We have an enemy in the spirit. And there are thousands of them. Thousands of them. Thousands of them that want to destroy your walk with God. Want to rob you of your blessings. Not, I'm not talking about houses and cars and money. I'm talking about your spiritual blessings. I'm talking about you being victorious. I'm talking about you having a, a, a voice of praise and a voice and a life that is counted for something for God. Not just wrapped up in self and wrapped up in your things of your own life. That's one of the strongholds the enemy has on many, many Christians today. They are so wrapped up about self. And he has a stronghold in that area. God says no. What's happened is you surrendered that to God and you need to give it back to God and you need to start taking the ground. Amen? He says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. And this is the important part right here. For thou hast smitten all my enemies. Oh, you have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Hallelujah. 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 In Psalm 42, verse 10. As with a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me. Have you ever been that hurt before? Have you ever felt that way before? That your very bones hurt because you just couldn't move because of things that have happened in your life? While they say daily unto me, where is your God? 
Understand that the enemy will use people to discourage you. He'll use people, and he'll say this, where is your God? You prayed, where is your God? You prayed and believed for this, but it didn't happen. Where is your God? And people say that to me, well, where is your God? You've been praying for a long time for different things, and it hasn't happened yet. Where is your God? I say the same place he's always been. Our timetable is not his timetable. Hallelujah. I want you to understand, there were people in the Bible that God made promises to that they never saw the end of that promise in their, own, in their natural life, but their descendants did. Amen. Sometimes God will give us a promise, and he, he'll have us walk by faith, and we'll walk by faith, and God will give us victory after victory after victory, but the end of that thing, we don't see it. <clears throat> But those who come up behind us, they're the ones that see it. You and I are here this morning, not because we have found ourselves here. We are here because people in the past have prayed for our generation, have prayed for us, and we're a fulfillment of their prayers. I'll never forget the time I was about five years old. There's a little church on County and Sawyer Street, right near, uh, right near your house. That little white church right near your house. And I remember being five years old, and I remember my mother allowing me to go to um, vacation. It was a vacation Bible school, okay, in that church. And I remember they were doing some plaster Paris thing. You know, back then that's what they did, plaster Paris and all that stuff. And I remember I was having a hard time. I got it all in my hands and, and stuff. And so I ran out, and I was sitting on the wall near the fence. I, I remember this as a little kid. And I remember this lady came out, and she, she said, what's the matter? And I was crying, and I said, I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. And she said, come over here. She gave me a hug, and she put her hand on my head. And she said, Lord, use him in the ministry. Use him for your glory. And even though I went through years and years and years of wandering on my own way, wandering in the wilderness, God in his divine plan brought me to the place where he has for my life. I want to encourage you. I don't care what it looks like on the outside. You just believe God from what he has said, and it will happen. Amen. I never met that lady again, and I know someday in heaven I probably will. They can say all they want, where is thy God? And I tell them he's right where he always, will, always is, and he always will be, and I'm not going to despise God by... Uh, dragging his name through the mud simply because I don't get what I think I should get. Psalm verse 60, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 12. Psalm verse 60, my water person is lacking. <clears throat> Becca's getting it. Psalm 60, verse 12. Through God, through God's, with God's help, we will do mighty things, for he will trample down our foes. I want to read it from the King James. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread, that shall tread down our adversaries, our enemies. Thank you, sweetie. Through God, not through ourselves. Through God. You look at any great athlete. Name them. Michael Jordan. One of the greatest athletes I've ever witnessed watch, play basketball. Larry Bird. Robert Parrish. Tom Brady. But you look at these athletes, they didn't just one day wake up and get on the field and, and be great. It took dedication. It took time and effort and training and training and repetitive and repetitive of going out there and doing the same thing, the same thing, the same thing, the same thing every single day. 
That's how greatness begins. It doesn't just come by sitting with your hands folded and expecting God to do everything. He won't do it. Trust me, he will not do it. Because everything that God does is lasting. Some people say, oh, God did this, God did that. And then uh, six months later, it's all gone. What, well, what happened? I thought God did it. You're right back in the same hole you were in. How come you're in the same hole again if God did it? Let me tell you, if God does it, you're not back in the hole again. It's the same way with people that have a hard time with smoking. They come to the altar, oh, I'm sorry, God. You know, God, please help me, please help me. And they, they drop the cigarettes on the altar. And they go right back out in their car. They got a pack right there in the glove box. And they go out and they start light up again. Come on now, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, but I want you to understand, that's man trying to do it. But when you allow God to do it, hallelujah, I can stand here and testify to you right now that over 36 years ago, God delivered me from cigarette smoking. He delivered me from drugs. He delivered me from alcohol. Hallelujah. He delivered me from cursing. Thirty years ago, he delivered me from alcohol, drinking every single day, sitting on that bar stool every single day. And for 30 some odd years now, I have never gone back to sitting on a stool, drinking the alcohol again, because I allow God to take that out of my life. <laughs> oh, I, was, I wasn't always a little nice little preacher boy. Oh, no, uh-uh. You knew me in the world. I was a party animal. Me and my friend Joe, which he's not here today, he's sick. Him and I were party animals. We used to go to Boston, man. We were, you know, New Bedfordites going to Boston, the big city, and party. Two nuts almost got killed. Through our God, we shall do valiantly. For it is he that shall tread down our enemies. He will tread them down. But you and I have got to line ourselves up and be in the battle formation. It's not about the soldiers sitting down. I don't know if you've seen that, that commercial. I forget what it is. It's about uh, England. And they, you know, the guy's there like this, and he's got his hat on. And then all of a sudden this guy comes, he's got a robe on, and he's got a, a, a rifle and a, and a, a bunch of snacks with him, and then he sits down with him, because he's relieving him, and he sits down, and all of a sudden you see him, the rifle's over here, and he's sleeping, and the rifle falls to the ground, and he wakes up. But you know what, that's, that really shows the life of some Christians. All they want to do is eat and relax, and, you know, just, just, you know, let life go by, and, you know, they're soldiers, but they, they got their gun over here. God says, no, you have to be on God 24-7. You've got to be ready. I remember in Boston during the time of the revolution, they had the Minutemen, right? Is that right? Was it the Minutemen? Why did they call them the Minutemen? They had to be ready in a minute. It wasn't a cleaning company. They had to be ready at a moment's notice when the enemy comes. They were ready to fight. They were battle ready, battle trained, ready to, ready to go into war. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Understand, when humanity comes against you as a Christian, that they're not your enemy. They're not your enemy. When someone begins to attack you, just tell them, just tell them, say, hold on, hold on, hold on. Father, in the name of Jesus, I cast the devil out of this person that's racking her mind and her spirit against me because I know it's not her. 
There's a spirit of influence that's coming through her. God, I bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. You know what will happen? They'll look at you like this. And say, I know it's not you. I know that's not you. But I know there's an enemy that's using you. I want you to know I'm praying for you. That's what the Bible says, bless your enemies. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. Now look at this. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Why is it that so many Christians are blind to the things that the Word of God says that this world is under the control of the enemy? Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. They are in operation. They want to destroy you. But people say, oh, it's just life, you know. Look at, look at the school systems. Look at, look at the way these millennials are coming out of schools. If you, if you go to one of them, tell them, oh, you've got a pimple on your cheek? Oh, they've got to go away for a week. They've got to go to a, a rehab. Because their feelings are hurt. The rules of this world, the darkness of this world, is fighting against the church. You know, when I look at the conditions of the world, you know who I blame? The church. You want to know why the world is running rampant and God's kingdom seems to be taking a back seat? Is because of the church. What's the church? A building? No, you, me. Because we haven't taken the authority that God has given us. We, we don't pray anymore. I can guarantee you right now, if I said on Monday night at 7 p.m., I'm giving $100 out to the first 25, 30 people that will be here for prayer, there will be 25, 30 people here at the door. Come on. Because you know what? Corporate prayer is not important to you anymore. It's just another program of the church. No, it's the very heartbeat of the church. Oh, I don't need, I just need God once a week. Well, guess what? That's all you're going to get. When you pray to God, what if God said to you, well, okay, I'm, 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 I, you come once a week, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that next week. Oh, but God, I need it. No, no, it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll meet it next week. No. Look at this. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. They're powerful. What do you got to fight the enemy? What do you got to fight the enemy? You can answer it if you want to. You got the what? You got the spirit. That's good. I'm glad everybody's got the spirit. What else you got? You're going to need more than the spirit. Huh? Got the word of God in you? That's great. What else you need? Huh? The helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, breastplate of righteousness, all those things that will protect you. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the shield of faith that will quench all the fiery dots of the enemy. <laughs> come on, Sister Lucy, you want to come up here and preach with me? Come on. <laughs> ah, you got it in you, then, don't you? But don't you want that? Are you a fighter? Oh, no, I'm not a fighter, I'm a lover. That, that, that's, that's delusional. Be a fighter in the spirit. Be a fighter with the things of God. Don't let the enemy walk all over you. 
Don't let them tread down upon you. Don't let them step on you. Don't let them take the things that God has intended for you. So many people are going to be up in heaven, and God's going to say, look what I had for you. This is what I had for you. I had ministry for you. Thousands upon thousands of people would have been blessed by you, but instead you chose this little thing over here. But I wanted to bless you. But you couldn't get out of your own way. Your own excuses kept you from the things that I had intended for your life. I've talked to some preachers, you know, and I, they, we, we, as we talk, they say, well, how, how large is your congregation? And I tell them, they say, how long have you been doing that? I said, oh, good 21 years. I say, 21 years? Man, I would have been gone a long time ago. I would have left there a long time ago. And I say, well, that's why you have nothing. Only if you're willing to pay the price. So God called me here. That's why I'm here. Could God change that? Yes. But for now, he has me here. And I'm here. I'll be here as long as the voice of God tells me to stay here. But you need to fight. You need to fight for the things of God. You need to fight the enemy who's opposing you every single day of every single moment, 24-7. He is fighting against you. He's making you so weak. He's making you so... The word I'm trying to find. Comfortable. Complacent. That's what he does. See, it's one thing when you diagnose something and you find out what the problem is. Do you leave it or do you get it fixed? Your car, engine light comes on. They diagnosed that problem and said, if you don't get this taken care of, okay, it could blow your engine. Okay. Do you fix it? Or do you just let it continue going on? See, we do that with our lives. There's things in your life that God has diagnosed and said, this is the problem. Now you need to change. And you still, year after year after year after year, are in the same thing and in the same place because you refuse to fix it. Well, eventually it's going to break. The sad part about it is the discernment is gone. There's no really wanting to fix it because you've learned to live with it. God says, no, don't learn to live with it. Let me fix it. Let me, ha let me get the victory where you have surrendered over to the enemy. But let me get the victory for you by submitting. 1 Peter 5a, how do we overcome? By being sober. Could you put the uh, King James up for me? I like that word. First Peter 5 eight. Be sober. You ever see a drunk driver? About 38 years ago, you would have saw one with me going down the street. Drove drunk all the time. Not all the time, but most of the time I was out partying. A person who's not sober doesn't have control of all of his faculties. You do things that you wouldn't normally do when you're, when you're not sober. You take more risks when you're drunk than you would when you're sober. It amazes me because I, I do a comparison 
And I look and I say, God, look at the risks that we took. Look at the things that we did be, before we were Christians. And then we become Christians and we don't want to take any risks. But we did all those crazy things, all those risky things that we did. And I say, my God, we need to take a risk in the things of God. He said, be sober. Have your mind, your, your faculties in order. Don't let the enemy come in and get all this confusion and all kinds of cobwebs in your head and, and, you, and you don't know left from right and you don't know front from back and, 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 you, and oh, well, this is just the way it's going to be for the rest of my life. I'm just going to have to bear with this. This is my cross. Jesus gave me this cross. That's not the cross he gave you. The cross he gave you is the cross to eliminate your sinful nature from having control over you. That's the cross he gave you. He didn't give you cancer. That's not your cross to bear. He didn't give you mental illness. That's the cross you have to bear. No. Be sober. And here's a word. Be vigilant. You know what that means? Mean business. You mean business. Be vigilant. Don't give up. Don't come short. I'm, I'm vigilant. I'm not giving up, devil. You're not going to have the victory anymore. You've got to start fighting. You've got to start speaking it out. Come on. Be vigilant. Why? Why? Because your adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion. Let me tell you something. If you're, if you're, if you're down walking somewhere, I don't know, somewhere, wherever your neighborhood or downtown or whatever, and all of a sudden you come around the corner and then here's a lion at you. <laughs> Not the cowardly lion. But a real lion. What are you gonna do? I, I, no, I mean, are you just gonna are you just gonna walk? Oh, I gotta get my shots. I gotta get my. I gotta get my bread and my milk. No, you know you know what you're gonna do. Come on now, you know what you're gonna do. What'd you say? Pick up a rock. Who said pick up a rock? Alicia. Well, probably she's right. She'd have to pick up a rock because I know that uh, uh, Louie's going to run. Pick up a rock. How about stand upon the rock? Daniel shut the mouth of a lion. Come on, somebody. Daniel shut the mouth of a lion. He even laid on his stomach. He's like a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he doesn't say will devour, says whom he may devour. He's got to have permission. He can't just do anything to you. I told you, I think I told you the story, but I'm going to tell it in ending. And read one more scripture. Because I don't want to say, I don't want to be accused of saying I'm going to end and then I don't end. Okay. So I got one scripture in this story. <clears throat> we were living where we're living now, and we just, I think we were there maybe a year or two or something like that. And I was coming home. As I was coming in the gate, there was this dog down on Summer Street. And he was running full bore at me. Lip was curled up. Teeth were showing. <laughs> now, I'm at my gate. And I see him coming. 
And he's growling. <laughs> and I went just like this. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I rebuke you. And that dog stopped, put his tail between his legs. <laughs> And he ran away. True story. No exaggeration. True story. My wife, we live in North Providence. We used to call this dog the red ticket dog because he had a license and it was a bright red. We called him the red ticket dog. And every time Linda's car would come down the street, he <laughs> after a car, and then she'd pull in the driveway and he'd leave her alone. She come running in the house. Oh, that red ticket dog! That red ticket dog's after me. The red ticket dog. And I guess one time she had walked to her mom's house or something because she lived around the corner. And she was walking back home. She's walking home, and guess who coming after her? Red ticket dog. And you know Linda. <laughs> Here come the red dog. <laughs> Here come the red ticket dog. And then it's like, ah! Did you say Jesus? She went, ah! Jesus! And the dog came up, put his paws on her shoulder, and started licking her face. True story. She didn't know she had victory over that dog. But she said the name Jesus and turned up. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Let me, let, me, let me read the last scripture. Finally, Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not your own might, not your own strength. But be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. How do you do that? By not surrendering. When the enemy comes in like a flood against you, when he comes with accusations, when he comes with all kind of cruelty to you, just tell him, say, not here. My hope is in Christ. My hope is in God. Many are they that trouble me. Trouble me, many are they that rise up against me. But thou, O oh Lord, art a shield to me, the glory and the lifter of my head. I'm not going to fight this battle in the flesh. I'm not going to surrender either. But I'm going to wait upon the Lord. Amen? Let's all stand in closing. Do not surrender. Do not surrender. Don't let the enemy rob you. Don't let the enemy take from you the blessings that God has intended for you. Amen? Father, we thank you. We praise you. I ask that you bless those on Facebook. God, I pray, God, that you will bless them. Let your word penetrate their hearts and their minds. And, Father, may it cause them to be obedient, to not surrender to the things of this world or the ways of this world or the influence of this world. God, I pray that you will be with them, strengthen them, encourage them. Lord, Bless they're going in, they're coming out, they're lying down, they're rising up. When they go to the left, be there. When they're going to the right, be there for them. When they go forward, be there for them. When they go backwards, let, them be, let you be there with them, Father. Lord, I thank you for them this morning. I pray a blessing upon them. I pray, God, you keep us in good health. And We pray for those who are sick that couldn't make it today. Father, we pray that your hand would be upon them, and that they would have a quick recovery. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you this morning. Greet one another before you leave.